I assume that we're live. Uh, welcome everybody to the very first Free Press Book Club online meeting. Uh, my name is Erin Labar. I am the manager of audience engagement for news and I'm one of the people who is running the book club. I just wanted to pop on really quick here and thank you all so much for not only registering for this new thing that we're trying, but being so engaged and, and taking part in the Facebook group and sending us questions and emails and we read everything and we really appreciate um, all the positive feedback you've been giving us and um, that you're tuning in tonight. So um, before I get on with my housekeeping, I'm just gonna introduce the three people that we have with us tonight. So in the bottom left corner, we have uh, our host for tonight, which is the Free Press Books editor, Ben Sigurdsson. And then in your top left, we have the break author, Katharina Vermette. And then your bottom right corner, we have uh, Angela to Togerson, is that correct? Togerson. Yeah. Togerson, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> I practice all day and I still screwed it up. Um, she's repping McNally Robinson Hello. tonight, and she's going to do uh, a little intro in a second. Um, but just before we get started, uh, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, if you want to comment, I see a lot of you are already taking advantage of the chat. So if you have questions or comments or you want to kind of have a side discussion with anybody, um, feel free to get in there and uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that. So if we have more questions coming in, I can funnel those to Ben. Um, please stick around till the very end. So we're going to announce our June pick at the end of this meeting and you don't want to miss that. Um, we will be sending an email out tomorrow morning with all the information about that as well, but get a heads up tonight. Um, and then for those who are free press subscribers and who are eligible for the draw, I'll be doing that tomorrow morning. So keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, and if you're a winner, I will be contacting you directly and you'll have next month's pick sent to you. Um, and that's pretty much it for me. So I'm going to pass along to Angela to kind of get the formal part of the evening kicked off. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much to Ben and Aaron at the Winnipeg Free Press for coming up with this great idea and bringing us all together. And a truly heartfelt thank you to Katharina Vermette for this extraordinary book and for introducing the reader to these amazing characters that speak to the strengths of Indigenous women and the power and love that family has. Uh, the Break is one of those novels that you never forget the first time you read, you read it and what you were doing. One of the great advantages of being a bookseller and working with McNally Robinson is that we often get to read books first. I'll never forget Chris Hall, our co-owner, uh, handing me a copy of The Break and asking me if I would read it. When I finished, I immediately turned back to the first page because I was completely loath to let go of these people. The characters, the women that Katharina has created don't simply leap off the page. They become real, they lodge firmly in your heart and they stay with you. She takes you on a journey with this family from happy memories and traditions to tragedy filled pasts, losses and disappointments, heartaches and sorrows. Yet these are resilient women who find joy in their lives and their families and each other. The ferocity in which they support and care for one another is powerful, more powerful than I think any other book of a multi-generational family I have ever read. You hurt when they hurt, you sob when they cry. I actually finished reading this book on an airplane and I'm 90% certain I terrified my seatmates. <laughs> <laughs> and most of all, you hope when they hope. This is a story that begins with an unspeakable assault and shocking crime, but neither of the two young victims, Emily nor Ziggy, are simply described as that or allowed to be seen in any way as a one dimensional victim. And in turn, which is a truly incredible feat, Katharina's character Phoenix isn't just simply the perpetrator or the villain. Her loneliness, her complete inability to care for herself because no one has ever shown her how, and her heart-wrenching heart -wrenching background makes you just want to reach out and wrap your arms around her. Actually, at the break's launch, I had to physically restrain myself, Katharina, from asking you, just tell me, the family's going to be okay. They have each other. Just tell me that Phoenix is okay as she could possibly be and is still here. <laughs> After Chris and I had read the advanced copy, we talked about how many copies we thought we should order. And we just said, all of them. We want all of the copies. So we finally decided upon a thousand and had to convince uh, the rep at House of Anansi that yes, we were truly serious. We wanted that many. I believe she's actually watching right now. So if you need backup on that, she could provide it. It's pretty rare for us to order books in those quantities, but we sold those first thousand copies and haven't looked back. The break sat on our bestseller list for so long, well over a year, that still, whenever a customer asks for a copy of the book, our eyes immediately go to our bestseller table before we even begin to look over and lit. In fact, it sat on our bestseller list for so long, it made us realize that we had no idea what the actual record was and that 
anything would have to compare to it and probably won't until there's another Katharina Vermette book. So thank you again for all of joining us for this discussion from the safety and comfort of your homes. Thanks again to Ben and Aaron and the Winnipeg Free Press for allowing Miss myself and McNally Robinson booksellers to take part. And thank you again, Katharina, for this extraordinary book, who it is now my privilege to introduce to you all. <laughs> thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Um, and who can clap. <laughs> clap, clap. Thank you. That was that was so touching. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to. Yeah, I'm I'm moved and I'm and I'm speechless. And I'm gonna try to follow that up well. Um, I am honored to be here on this book club and I'm honored that the book was chosen. I, I my immediate reaction when it was chosen was no, it's it, that's a really sad book. We need happy. We need uplifting. But um, I, I do, I you know, I did take it because it was really cool opportunity. <laughs> um, but also, like, I do think in this time we need to be reminded of these societal challenges that are still almost in many ways exacerbated during this time. Um, so, if anything, and I do write a lot about trauma, and I do write a lot about issues that I feel should be at the forefront. I also write fiction, so they are fictional books. But I, um, I do think that at this time, um, hopefully we are, we are safe and hopefully we are secure and, and hopefully we can assist in whatever way we can those who are not safe and those who are not secure. Um, yes, I'm gonna read a quick bit and then I'm going to go over to questions because the idea is this is a book club, right? So hope, you know, the idea is that everyone's read it. So really I'm not telling you anything you haven't already known, um, but it's always nice to, to situate the text with, with voice. So I'm just going to read the first part. Um, I always, I call them my poetic interludes. They were my own late addition to the to the book because I felt like I wanted a little bit more poetry in there. I like to cram poetry in wherever I can. And uh, yeah, so I'm just going to read the first part where we outline what the break is and, and where we, we are in the world of this book. A fictional book. <laughs> the break is a piece of land just west of McPhillip Street. A narrow field about four lots wide that interrupts all the closely knit houses on either side and cuts through every avenue from Selkirk to Leela, that whole edge of the North End. Some people call it nothing and likely don't think about it at all. I never called it anything, just knew it was there. But when she moved in next door, my Stella, she named it the break, if only in her head. No one had ever told her any other name and for whatever reason, she thought she should call it something. It's Hydroland, was likely set aside in the days before anything was out there, when all that low land on the west side of the Red River was only tall grasses and rabbits, some bush and clusters, all the way to the lake in the north. The neighborhood rose up around it. Houses built first for Eastern European immigrants who were pushed to that wrong side of the railroad tracks and kept away from the affluent city south. Someone once told me that North End houses were all made cheap and big, but the lots were narrow and short. That was when you had to own a certain amount of land to vote, and all those lots were made just inches smaller. The tall middle hydro towers would have been built after that. Huge and gray, they sand on either side of that small piece of land, holding up two smooth silver cords high above the tallest house. The towers repeat every two blocks over and over, going far into the north. They might even go as far as the lake. My Stella's little girl Maddie named them robots when the family first moved in beside them. Robots is a good name for them. They each have a square-like head and go out a bit at the bottom like someone standing at attention. And there's two arms overhead that hold the cords up into the sky. They were a frozen army standing guard, seeing everything. Houses built up and broken down around them, people flooding in and out. In the 60s, Indians started moving in. Once status Indians could leave reserves and many moved to the city. That was when the Europeans slowly started creeping out of the neighborhood like a man sneaking away from a sleeping woman in the dark. Now there are so many Indians here, big families, good people, 
and also gangs, hookers, drug houses, and all those big, beautiful houses somehow sagging and tired like the old people who still live in them. The area around the break is slightly less poor than the rest, more working class, just enough to make the hardworking people who live there think they are out of the core and free of that drama. There are more cars in the driveways than on the other side of McPhillips. It's a good neighborhood, but you can still see it if you know what to look for. If you can see the houses with never open bedsheet covered windows, if you can see the cars that come late at night, park right in the middle of the break far away from every house and stay only 10 minutes or so before driving away again. My Stella can see it. I taught her how to look and be aware all the time. And I don't know if that was right or wrong, but she's still alive. So there has to be some good in it. I've always loved the place my girl calls the break. I used to walk through it in the summer. There's a path you can go along all the way to the edge of the city. And if you just look down at the grass, you might think you were in the country the whole way. Old people plant gardens there, big ones with tiny rows of corn and tomatoes, all nice and clean. You can't walk through it in the winter though. No one clears away. In the winter, the break is just a lake of wind and white, a field of cold biting snow that blows up with the slightest gust. And when snow touches those raw hydro wires, they make this intrusive buzzing sound. It's constant and just quiet enough you can ignore it, like a whisper you know as a voice but can't hear the words. And even though there are more, they are more than three stories high, when it snows, those wires feel close, low, and buzz that sound that's almost like music, just not as smooth. You can ignore it. It's just white noise, and some people can ignore things like that. Some people hear it and just get used to it. It was snowing when it happened. The sky was pink and swollen and the snow had finally started to fall. Even from inside her house, my Stella heard the buzzing as sure as her own breath. She knows to expect it when the sky fills with clouds. But like everything she's been through, she has just learned to live with it. That was just Perfect. Thank you so much for, for reading that, that introduction to the book. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Free Press Building is up on Mountain Avenue, which is like, mm -hmm. is very close to the break. And so I drive through and around and past that area all the time. So when I, when I first started reading this book for the first time, I was, I was completely floored. And I was, it was it just sort of, as I was reading it every day, I would drive, sort of take little turns and, and, and sneak around past, um, uh, What's the, um, can't remember the name of the street. Anyway, <clears throat> to get to work. And uh, and it was just so, it was so visceral. And it was, in the, uh, it, you know, it was, I don't think it was in the middle of winter when I would have read it, but it was it was in spring. And and uh, it just, I found myself slowing down. And like a couple of times I actually pulled over and just sort of took it all in. It was just so, such a, a visceral thing to to, to be, be near. Um, what is it like to you, uh, for you to sort of, um, you know, a few years out, go back to this book. I mean, it, it, it's sort of like another, a second launch for it, right? In the sense that it's the same kind of format that you would have at McNally without mm -hmm. uh, signing books and stuff like that. But um, what, what's it like to sort of revisit it a few years on? Uh, and I think there's a question probably near the end of this discussion, probably that will tie into this a little bit as well about your next book. So. <laughs> um, it is strange. It's strange that it still has a life. Um, and reading that passage, I'm editing all the justs. I have a problem with the word just. Um, I don't know why. What? Sorry? Too many or not enough? There is way too many. We had to do edits for just in that. I, I overuse those words. So that's always like, you know, when you're reading your own stuff, you're always editing as you go along and you really get disgruntled that it's in print and you can't change anything anymore. <laughs> um, but it's really strange to me. Like when I... This book was a long time coming. It took about 10 years or so to write in parts. It started as a series of short stories, um, which I wrote um, while I was at uh, UBC. I was completing an MFA at UBC. And when I put them all together, I knew they had to be a novel. I, I felt, they felt incomplete. You know, I, I, they, 
I attempted to write short stories. I was really just writing like there should have been ellipses at the end of all of them because I just wanted to go on and on and on, which is proof that I'm still writing about these people, you know, five years later. Um, I just go on and on. Uh, so, but I really didn't know that this book would have a life. It was really something that I needed to write and figure out for myself. It was something I wanted to write and figure out for the people that I loved and the people that I felt were connected to my inspiration for this story. But I honestly thought I would be run out of town with pitchforks and, you know, <laughs> and torches, you know, because it is a really hard book in some places. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I really fought for the trigger warning at the beginning of the book. I was told that we don't do that in can Canadian literature um, by, by someone, but also because most of my readers of the book, of the, the pre, pre-ARC book, pre-advanced um, yeah. reading copy, uh, were survivors, were survivors in one way or another. And you know, my, my information feedback from them was that they appreciate trigger warnings because it really helps situate and prepare you. Um, and I know myself, I like trigger warnings just so I know what I'm getting into. Uh, so I really put that in hoping to uh, stave off some pitchforks and torches. Well, you know, that's a, and I'm glad that you bring that up because I'm sort of making mental notes um, myself for, you know, subsequent months worth of, of book clubs that we'll end up doing or whatever. But that would have, um, I feel like that probably would have been something that would have been useful for us to include as well. So I, I take that into, you know, into consideration this going forward for sure. And uh, if, if I could go back and do it again, I, I certainly would. I hope that, I hope that uh, people came away from, from this book with a, a really enriched experience of, you know, of, of life here, although an unnamed Winnipeg, but, but, um, but still, you know, I, I realize that there are sections that would have been quite, um, yeah, triggering for, for people and, and probably should have, have covered that off the top. Um, uh, that, it's it not, is at the beginning of the book and at the beginning of I, yeah, I know, the true, and everything. True, I, yeah, it's true, there. True. Yeah, kind of know from the description. <laughs> yeah. what we're going to um, be talking about some stuff. Yeah, and I mean, you were you you also mentioned you know sort of t using this book as part of part of our book club and it being sort of a sad book. And that was something after the fact where I was like, well, yeah, maybe I should have picked something that was a little you know more upbeat and easygoing. But your your book was one of the first that I thought of, and just because I thought you know we're working with local authors and this is such a hyper local book despite the fact that Winnipeg is not actually technically like named anywhere in it um it, the landmarks are so familiar um but it was it was one that I thought was just like so still worthwhile and so important for to to for, for as many people to read so um thank you again for taking part um uh, I was going to maybe just jump into some, you know, like I was saying just before we started broadcasting or whatever, is this what you call broadcasting? I don't even know. <laughs> whatever, doing our little yeah. virtual book club that there were, you know, at, at McNally launches, which I love and miss so much. Um, you know, I there's them too. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and John Taves, who we were talking about earlier as well, who hosts a lot of them, we miss him as well. Um, but, uh, you know, there are always uh, a, a number of in interesting questions after the, you know, the little Q&A between the, the host and, and the author or whatever. But, you know, they're often off the cuff and people are sort of, maybe they're a little more nervous and stuff talking in front of a large group of people. I know I am. I'm terrified of doing those, those McNally events. I love doing them, uh, especially for books that I, that I love. But, um, you know, and th in this capacity, we did get a bunch of questions in advance and are still sort of getting questions, I think, on the YouTube page, maybe over here, or maybe over here, um, as people watch this. Um, so I thought we would just jump right into them because a, a lot of them did do cover um, similar sort of questions that I, that I have or would have had anyway. So um, if you don't mind, I'll just jump right in. Jump right in. I'll, I'll try and keep the, the shuffling of paper. <laughs> Um, although you know, there's so many different things you can take advantage of uh, in a virtual tasting or not tasting I'm used to doing online wine tasting too, virtual reading um, that uh, it's it's a little less nerve-wracking so anyway um, so first of all someone had a question um, Ruby Shilke had a question about the significance of the title why is the patch of land referred to as the break I mean you sort of did touch on this in in this passage that you just read but is that a, a term that local North Enders use or is it a name that you just sort of pulled out of, out of nowhere? 
pulled out of nowhere. Um, I, uh, I actually lived in a house very similar to the house I described. Um, that is Stella's house in the book. Um, it wasn't on Magnus Avenue. I, I wanted to put it in a bit of an anonymous place because um, I knew the people who were living there at the time. Mm. Um, but it is, I live next to this big flat piece of land next to these hydro towers that they do hum. They, they mm -hmm. have this weird humming. Mm -hmm. I was convinced that I was getting headaches when I first moved in. Um, and there was something really strange about being next to them. It, they felt very powerful and very tall. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know what that land was called other than like the hydro field or, you know, different people have told me different things. Honestly, the break was just this idea of, of what to call it because mm -hmm. I wanted to call it something just like they say in the book. Um, it ended up being coming also a symbol for a lot of the things that happen in the book because there's a lot of brokenness and break. There's a lot of like this broken um, people, you know, and it's actually mentioned the word broken or break is mentioned in each most of the chapters in one way or another um, because it just ended up being this overriding kind of theme for lack of a better word okay um, so yeah totally pulled it up of my okay. uh jody jones asks i was wondering if there's a particular incident in winnipeg that inspired the author to write this story it actually wasn't winnipeg it was um uh, like i said it happened about 10 i started writing about 10 years before so that would put us around 2006 because the book was published in 2016 um and i remember at that time i was living in this house that was next to the break and there was a lot of news reports at the time about girls and gangs and girls committing violence and this idea of like oh my gosh shocking girls are not just maternal and pretty and exploited, they're actually you know, in, engaging in violence and perpetrators as well. Um, and I didn't understand, first of all, why that was so shocking, because I grew up with, of, of course, that can happen, we can, we can do anything. Um, but also I didn't understand why be, that was less sympathizing, if, if, um, be, mm -hmm. it, it's sympathetic, empathetic, because, you know, girls and boys who are engaged in these activities are often at such a lack of choice and opportunity in their lives. And, and they are no less worthy of support and acknowledge and sympathy and, and empathy because they're just communicating that in a different way. Um, not to take away from people's actions and not, of course, we always have to be accountable for our actions and the pain we cause, but you know, it, pain comes from pain and hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. I love that quote, it's not mine. Um, but I really wanted to, and then I also questioned myself, like why is a girl who commits violence more sympathetic than a boy? You know, so that's kind of where that kind of started. And then also there was an incident, I believe it was Smith College in the States where these two girls um, committed an, a horrible act of, of sexual violence against another girl. And I remember feeling very fraught by that idea, that idea that if we're, you know, um, if we're hurting each other, and, and this is similar in, in lots of our marginalized communities and lots of our communities, um, that if we're hurting each other, then it's, you know, it's it really doesn't matter who is hurting us. We're, we're hurting each other. So it's devastating and it's, um, it's un almost unrecoverable. So that's where I started. I started from this place of real hopelessness of, of these things and, and feeling that I felt many times in my life of the idea of intra-community violence and how it's so shameful when people in your community commit acts of violence against other people in your community. Um, but it all, it all comes from pain. So I really wrote myself in from hopelessness into hopefulness, trying to write through how we recover and how we actually stay sane and survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a question from Zoe Thompson. Um, the multi-generational story sounds very biographic in its clarity about family relationships. Do you have a close relationship with your characters in real life or did you base these stories, you know, on, on other, uh, you sort of touched on that a little bit, but, um, and she says, thank you for using such a strong voice to tell her stories as well. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Zoe Thompson. Um, it is not based on real people. That's the short answer. Uh, in, in one way or another, I think every character is a, quite a bit like me. Um, and sorry, that's a lawnmower. 
Oh, oh. there's one out here too. <laughs> Everyone's little... mowing their lawn now. The yes. gardens are the gardens are lit up this year. Yeah. Um, um, so it's not based on any anyone. I wanted to make sure not to take from anyone's story, um, except really my own, which I kind of take in and kind of put in there and in here and there. But it is it is fictionalized, and all the characters are fictionalized. They're all a bit like me in all the ways I didn't mean them to be, and they're all a bit not like me. Um, I, I do think I do think all writers do that. We all just were writing ourselves into things over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to make sure it was fictitious. I did want to make sure that the um, the lives I was portraying was, you know, not some symbolic is the wrong word, but they, I didn't want to take from anyone's story. So I did have to make sure they were over here in that world of make believe so that, um, but also real and, and real to, to life, you know, mm -hmm. realism is what they like to call it. Mm -hmm. That, really. Yeah, that sort of covered a, another question for, for that Melinda Kozik had. I found this to be such a poignant story, dreaming back continuously to read the and finish the story, but I always felt a cloud of sadness. Did your own life experience contribute to the story or did it reflect that of people you knew? So sort of covered that. Um, unless you had anything to add about that. No, I mean, <laughs> I uh, I write fiction for a reason. I, yeah. There's certain parts of my life that I've, I've shared openly. Mm -hmm. um, but also I, I write fiction because I like to explore it in a way that um, is a little more freeing because I'm not, you know, I don't, ha I don't want, I'm not interested in writing my story. I also mm -hmm. think that my story is also attached to so many other people's stories. So the permissions alone would just take up way too many time. Too much. Well, and, but that, that is sort of reflected in, in the book in the sense that there, there is all these, these widespread connections in this large sort of family structure that um you know that sort of plays throughout and and you know has people probably sometimes flipping back and forth to the, the little family tree at the beginning um this time when i read it this time i it is when I, I as soon as i sort of jumped into it it was like everything just sort of fell back into place but the first time i read it i found, I found it was quite helpful but um uh, sort of leapfrogging off of that there's a question from Lynn Schillinglaw who says I love how each chapter focuses on the perspective of one character which by the way are also believable in their traits and dialogue with others uh, her question is why did you choose Lou as a first person narrative character I love this question because it's such a technical <laughs> writer question yeah so, right, writer nerd right in here yeah. um Originally, most of the characters were first person because I, I write very free in first person because you're really just kind of person putting putting a character on and mm -hmm. um and just going forward uh but when you're writing a polyphonic book and when everyone if everyone is an i it gets confusing really mm -hmm. really quickly um so then i switched over to a close third which is actually um and something whenever i'm teaching writing i always like to you know get students to jump back and forth between first and third because there's so much you can learn not only about what you're writing about and your setting and all of those things that you're supposed to pay attention to but you really learn about your character and I'm actually going through this right now in my in my my new novel that I'm writing is I switched some first to thirds and, and back and forth and um and it's it's a really fun well fun is not the right way to describe what I write about um but it's it's an interesting exercise to figure out what I'm missing because a, a first person, you're really having to stay so super close. You're st literally stuck in their brains. Um, and if you, and a third point, third point of view lets you kind of step away and kind of explore. And it also lets the character hide from you a little bit, which is incredibly important in a lot of stories, um, particularly this story, because the information is revealed in the book, like in, in, in steps. Mm -hmm because everyone's kind of, you know, an unreliable narrator. Uh, Lou I kept in first because Lou keeps her cards very close to her chest. She doesn't reveal what's going on in her life. Um, and she's going through a lot of heartbreak and trying to um, compartmentalize that in order to help and assist with her family. So her outward face is very, very different than her in inward face. So I kind of kept her really close to me just so I could reveal all that. And the other first was uh, was Flora, Pukum Flora, who is only has one chapter toward the end of the book. Um, oh, that's because, right, yeah. Yeah, because I, because uh, she just came out that way and she was my Kukum and uh, my fictitious Kukum. 
and really I just had to do whatever she said to do Mm -hmm. um you can't you know I was just respecting my elders she wanted it like that and that's how she got it (laughs) that's fantastic I did notice some portion some sections of the book would start off um this is sort of a book nerdy follow-up question as well like so would sort of start off in present tense and then sort of almost flip into into past tense as they as they went on is that I rely I, well might have been typos you never know oh okay, well, I have an advanced copy so it's it, but yeah. I, I don't know it just felt that like was riddled with typos. you start in, in <laughs> present tense and then it would maybe it would just sort of like flash back to a previous event where it would yeah. then go into into past tense I really like that I thought that was a, a really cool uh Tool. It was a lot of flashbacks. It was a lot of because so many of the characters were kind of stuck alone, mm-hmm. particularly toward the beginning, and then they all come together. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of flashbacks, lots of people really reliving a lot of their stuff. Because mm-hmm. I, you know, and I think true to true traumatic events, when when one thing happens, it's almost like this uh, domino effect of all the other things kind of come to a head, and you really think about your own stuff. And mm-hmm. I think you know, it kind of kind of works from there so yeah there's lots and lots of flashbacks very mm-hmm. much living in the past and mm-hmm. in a lot of ways mm-hmm. i thought it connected some of the some of the characters you know even some of the the sort of um outlying characters with the the overlying you know this multi-perspective character narrative so so beautifully so i, I thought it was just so well done mm-hmm. um but speaking of other characters i did we did have one late question here from uh, sorry, I'm just, the reason I keep looking down every once in a while is because Aaron keeps sending me uh, messages or uh, with uh, other questions. And uh, so I'm trying to like recompartmentalize and reorder all these questions. Um, Judy Parker sent in a uh, question. Um, how do you respond to the criticism from some of the panel on Canada Reads? Did you, I don't know, maybe <laughs> Canada Reads? Um, that the, that the, oh, you're laughing already. I like it. <laughs> that the male there for laughter. The there was cursing in our back office during that panel, oh, just so you know. Yeah. The male characters were not made, imp- uh, were not sympathetic or were not made important enough. I know that I disagreed with the criticism as I saw the story as mainly about the women and their connections. And I also felt that the men were well drawn and I had empathy for them as well, but the women were where my real focus lay. Um, well, also just to let the audience know, I think it's yeah, called sorry. an audience still. I don't see, I'm not on the YouTube, so I don't see the questions. Otherwise I you know, answer them and be very distracted. So mm-hmm. um, uh, Canada Reads was a wonderful experience. Um, it's not the kind of thing you turn down. No, um, no, no, no. And, and uh, um, but it's, I don't know. I didn't watch it. I was just talking to Candy, um, Candy Palmiter, who was my, um, debater extraordinaire uh we talked a lot beforehand and then after um she was very very upset at 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 how everything went well but i by all accounts she did a brilliant job i couldn't i couldn't uh, watch it myself yeah i I Um, get that i get that yeah i couldn't watch it live and then when i found out what happened i just couldn't um i wasn't (laughs) overly i was a little perturbed i wasn't overly upset i mean Mm -hmm. it is a reality tv show it's Mm -hmm. our wacky canadian reality tv show where a bunch of celebrities get together and fight about books which is fabulous yeah (laughs) great but um i mean and it's a reality tv show so you have to make up you know conflict and 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 the drama and i mean i they're valid criticisms sure um i was trying to portray the men as again true to what i what i know and what i love um, my husband really took a lot of offense to that because uh, what was going on just because it um, he always stresses this idea of um, uh, of the indigenous man and he, he is an indigenous man and and he always says like the indigenous man you know when a woman tells you to do something you just do it that's the role of the indigenous man um, I don't know whether or not that's true or he's just you know um, <laughs> you know I, I found it to be true but I don't know if he was just humoring me as well Mm -hmm. um it is what it is I tried my very best with with the men um and uh I did write one character who was a like a he was in third person but a one main character was Tommy in the book and he 
kind of saves the day in the end so and he I thought you know he's a very strong kind of character even though he was strong and I love the fact that he went to his mom like when everything was falling apart he ran home to mom like every good boy does exactly. yeah that's, that's apparently how I write men characters <laughs> my one it was my first attempt at a male character and yeah when all went awry he went home to his mom and she made him some soup and made him feel better <laughs> well I do have a I do have a, <laughs> a, 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 a associated question with that from a from a, a reader as well from Dean Scaletta Tommy is a character um uh, doesn't really figure it all in the last 50 pages of the book even though it was his worth ethic and tenacity that ensured Emily's attackers would face justice uh that last passage that includes him is where he and his mother chat about his relationship with others with whom he shares a heritage uh, albeit not a skin tone, um, and then of course the supia. Was there a reason why his contribution to the storyline ended where and when it did? Um, I think he kind of just, I, I kind of ended where, where it ended. Mm -hmm. so, um, I do think um, as a character, uh, you know, Tommy goes on in, in a way, and I'm sure he he succeeds in, because he does have a lot of tenacity and perseverance, and I think he mm -hmm. is going to make a fabulous police officer arc, yeah. Um, I just, I think that he was an, he was an ally to the story. He was an, a, he was an assister to the story. He was a helper, um, and that was his role in the story, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, there was some kind of completion and closure. He was also the person, like in a technical way for, for the manuscript, um, he was a person who connected a lot of dots and he wasn't really connected, connected a lot of dots, but wasn't physically mm -hmm. connected to all the other characters. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of his function in the story. I mean, his function as a character, I think was to kind of, he's grappling with a whole bunch of things at the, at the same time as, as we all are, as all the mm -hmm. characters are, as they're doing one thing. Um, and I really feel like with that arc, again, going home to mom and getting some soup and answers um, really kind of completed him for, you know, perhaps for the time being, you know? Mm -hmm. but, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I've just got a, a few more questions. We'll sort of try and, I, I'm gonna, this one is sort of long. It has about six questions in it. So I'm gonna try and condense it to a, a couple. <laughs> um, I'm curious about uh, Judy Dekema De says, um, I'm curious about the use of the word home use when members of the family left Winnipeg to visit their ancestral homes. Does this mean that the individual family members don't connect with Winnipeg as home, didn't feel at home? Is this a common sentiment among, amongst the indigenous people slash families who have moved from their first nation to live in Winnipeg? Uh, also amongst indigenous families born and raised in Winnipeg. Um, and maybe I'll stop the questioning. Um, wow, yeah, gold star for Judy. Um, I love these questions, by the way. It, you're right. When you come to when it comes to online and like pre-received questions, people mm. go all out. And stuff. Yeah. I, I did my 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 graduate studies online, and you really go all out with the mm. with, with the questions and whatever. So gold stars all around. Totally. Um. I it's a hard question to answer. I I have to justify. I have to start up saying that I'm I'm only talking about you know certain perspectives that I am aware of and my own perspective as well. I, I do not in any way speak for all indigenous folks um, ever. Um, I do know the, the idea of home and the idea of going back home is, is something that I've always just known in the vernacular and the slang and the, in the way um, we, uh, people have described the place that they are from, their, where their family is. And that's not necessarily their ancestral home. That tends to be um, a reserve ship or, or a reserve or a township um, where their families have been for generations. You know, that's not necessarily where people have been traditionally for, for time immortal, immortal. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, I think. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's that connection to that home place for, for lack of, uh, for lack of a more accurate maybe place to, to be. Um, so the idea of if your family is from a reserve or from a town, like a Métis town or something, the idea is that's home. Then you can go back home and where you, you know, um, and where's your back home. Uh, my family has been in and around Winnipeg for several generations. So I am one of those um, Indigenous people or Métis person who uh, has been um, very urban for a very long time. 
Um, and that's for, for many, many reasons. One, because we didn't have a land base that we were never granted a land base. Uh, so, and, and also because uh, for many generations, um, the Métis people moved quite extensively throughout Western Canada and my family was no exception. Um, so as a Métis person um, speaking to people who had that kind of town or that kind of you know, reserve or that kind of back home, it was always this idea of, of envy because I didn't have a place necessarily that I could connect that to. The only place I had was, was Winnipeg and the city is, is many things and it's many, many beautiful things, uh, but it's by, by no means um, necessarily Métis exclusively any longer. Um, though I don't know, David Chartrand is working to kind of correct that with the purchase of the Bank of Montreal building and I hear other buildings too. I'm just kidding, I'm not taking over anything, it's okay. Um, but it does, it is, some, I have to say, I really welled up when I saw that Métis flag over top of the Bank of Montreal building at Portage in Maine. I think it's a wonderful symbolic gesture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, okay, so I think there's a couple other questions that sort of, they sort of got into characters and, and where they're where the characters went after the book. And so it's it's hard to sort of you know, <laughs> hypothesize or sort of speculate and well, maybe they did this, maybe they did that. Um, uh, so maybe one way we can sort of uh, tackle that is maybe um, talking about your next book, which has been announced. You've uh, signed a two book deal, correct? Mm -hmm. With Hamish Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Strangers will be coming out in the fall of next year. Is that correct? Yes. So and, far, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's true. That's a that's a good point. Actually, everything is in flux right now. Books that are, were supposed to be coming out, you know, last month have been pushed back to, and I'm, I'm sure Angela can attest to this as well, to the fall yeah. next yeah. year to mm -hmm. EBD sort of thing. So, I mean, if uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully things won't change in a long enough sort of lead time that uh, that everything will sort of stay the same, and and hopefully the situation will have changed a little bit. As well, um, but maybe you can um, you can give us not necessarily sort of like the the, the, the lowdown on what's for sure going to be happening. But uh, Kelly Friesen, who is a teacher, uh, asked about her your next book, The Strangers. Uh, she said, "My students have hypothesized that the title refers to Phoenix's family, and the book will focus on them." Um, she says. Can you tell us if we're on the right track or anything else about the up upcoming book? And I, I always sort of hesitate to ask authors about this because I know that they're quite often they're like, oh, I don't want to say too much, you know, because probably <laughs> now and then like everything will change, right? But it sounds like you've got at least a bit of a inkling of where the strangers might be going and then is set in the same world as the break, I understand. It is the same world and uh, yeah, gold stars all around for Miss Friesen's class. Um, Phoenix Stranger, her last name is Stranger. So the strangers are about the strangers, her family. Mm -hmm. um, she is the only character that is repeated in the book and the only character from the break that is repeated. The other ones are relatively new except for her mother who um, appeared very briefly in the last book and um, are in the break and we do get quite a bit of we knew know a lot about Elsie Elsie Stranger when we were coming in because she's quite revealed as she's one of the stories that Stella recounts um, when she's going through her um, spiral and also we meet her very briefly at the end of the book where she uh, keeps Phoenix at the Remand Center um, I, I feel like we're, I'm set, I always feel like when I'm starting a book that I never like to talk about it too much um, because, you know, it does change so many times. I feel like now I'm almost in a place where I think it's all settled um, and it is a continuing story of a sense. Um, it is also a complete offshoot. It is a story of this family kind of exclusively and we all, and it happens in, the events happen after the events of the break. So they are touched on, but it is, it is something new that's happening um and i and i really didn't mean to to um but it is its own standalone book because i did want to write this kind of family saga is very much an entrenched french metis family uh, which is very different than the fam the all of the families in the break um because there's several different um there's metis there's french metis and there's mm -hmm. um so it is something different it's very much it's stand its own thing 
um, I, and I didn't intend to write it necessarily like that. I, um, I was actually, um, I thought the characters in the break were gonna stay put and put in the places that I left them when I finally stopped mm -hmm. writing the book and went, hurrah, it's over. Um, but uh, yeah, I was actually at a writing event um, not too long after it launched where uh, I forget what writer said that, you know, whenever she wrote her novels and the characters just left her um, and they went away into that neither world that characters go to. Um, and it occurred to me that these characters had just kept going on and on for me. And I, maybe because I tend to go on and on, and on I don't know, um, but they became very close. They were with me for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe I just didn't want to let them go, um, which is another theme of the book, which we don't like to let things go. Me, you know, not, not um, the royal we. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, uh, there was more to explore. So there, yeah. I, I did want to keep an interconnected world. Um, I did make a whole other genealogy because I love genealogy. Mm -hmm. we're, we're Métis, we love those genealogies, you know. Um, and uh, I just wanted to do something different, but also like kind of keep to that world. I love books with that are kind of connected in that way, connected mm -hmm. but not. Yeah. Well, I think that's as, as good a, a place to end it. I mean, so I'm so pleased that you were, uh, you know, after taking so long to write the break, you were willing to come back and, and talk and, and, you know, having talked about it many times over the years, come back and talk about it one more time and give us a taste of sort of, you know, what's to come as well. And thank you so much for fielding all these fantastic reader questions. I was fantastic. so by them. They were just so great. And I wish I could have put them all in, but uh, time's a ticking and, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you, uh, your reading and you a answering all these questions. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. And, and Angela as well for the fantastic introduction. That was like, yes. I, to, I almost had to put my, I almost had to put my camera on mute or whatever for to, so I get my samples <laughs> out of the way. That was really nice, so. Brilliant, it was brilliant. And yeah, thank, thank you, yeah. Well, I'm gonna pop back on here really quick. Um, I'm just gonna echo what Ben said. Thank you so much, um, Angela and Katharina for your time tonight. This was such an inspiring discussion. I just enjoyed it so much. So thank you again. Um, and just before we go, time for the June Book Club pick, which is this, Don't Try This at Home by Rob Krause and Daria Salomon. So Rob and Daria are a married couple and they decide, they're based in Winnipeg, they decided to lease their house, sell their car, pack up their two young kids and go traveling around the world for a year. They hit 15 countries. Um, and the interesting thing about this novel is that the first half was written uh, by Daria from her perspective on the year. And then you flip it over and the second half was written by Rob on his perspective of that same year together. So it's very funny. It's like a perfect summer read, but it also you know, has makes some poignant thoughts on marriage and parenthood and traveling on a budget and sort of the idea of home um, so we thought it would be a really great read to kind of kick off summer and, you know, none of us can travel so we can live a little bit vicariously through Daria and Rob and their family adventure, for lack of a better word. It's quite an adventure. And they're hilarious. Like they'll be, I mean, and, 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 and they just, they'll, they'll be so much, they'll be a lot of fun to talk to as, as fun as Katharina was, but in a very different way. <laughs> in a very different way. Yeah. Um, so that meeting will be June 29th. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out an email tomorrow morning with all the information about the book and the meeting and upcoming dates for emails and information. Um, but for tonight, we're all done. And I just want to thank you all again for watching and thank uh, Katharina and Angela and Ben for being here as well. And we will see you all next